In August of 2013, a quirky game, released on an equally quirky console, graced the video game world to a very mixed reception. Directed by Hideki Kamiya and produced by Itsushi Inaba, the game obviously had tons of love and effort poured into it, but sadly sales didn't match the care that permeated throughout the game. This would not be the end of the title's life, however. In 2020, a Kickstarter was created to fund a remastered version of The Wonderful 101 on Nintendo Switch, PS4, and PC, and it broke down each goal with surprising ease. I mean, this was a game that was originally a bit of a financial mess, and it managed to raise tons of money for updated versions for different platforms, which would then reach even more of an audience. Apparently there was a rather significant group of people who really enjoyed the game, or simply wanted to play it on their preferred platform, and they weren't going to let it slip into obscurity again. So here we are. One of my favorite games from the Wii U managed to make it off that platform and into reach of a new group of potential fans. In an otherwise pretty terrible year, the incredibly quick release of this gem of a game was a bright spot. However, though it has found new life on new platforms for a new crowd with new updates for both gameplay and visuals, it still has to find its way into players' hands. Here's where I want to make a case for The Wonderful 101. It's the odd Nintendo-like action-adventure game that's not solely Nintendo's exclusive anymore. The Wonderful 101 has flaws, sure, but its strengths far outweigh any weaknesses it has. So let's get to it! I'm not gonna lie, the battle mechanics and general gameplay in The Wonderful 101 has a bit of a learning curve. I mean, I was already familiar with this, yet I still had moments of struggle toward the beginning of my new experience on my Nintendo Switch. The battle mechanic concept, in its most simplistic and watered-down version, isn't too hard to grasp. The player assumes the role of a single Wonderful One at any given time and has to manage the other Wonderful Ones that have joined the squad. These other squad mates can, quite literally, be turned into various tools for battle, including a giant fist, sword, gun, and more. This move is named Unite Morph. It's not too bad, right? Well, putting this into action on the battlefield is a bit more of a task. In a way similar to Bayonetta 1 and 2, the player has to purchase new moves, and getting the currency to spend these moves requires, well, fighting. The problem with the Wonderful 101 is that key moves that drastically help the players within battle are locked until purchased with the in-game currency. And I'm not talking about just additional moves that are neat and could add to a combo. Unite Guts, the move that essentially helps to block and repel attacks, and Unite Spring, a move that acts as a dodge, cost 15,000 points and 30,000 points respectively. This is quite a pain considering that these moves are generally very useful and even more so for players whose playstyles incorporate them. Now, in comparison, these prices are not too expensive when matched up with other moves that are available for purchase, but it's still kind of a pain that these two essential moves have to be bought. Having these essential moves locked from the start really hinders the gameplay at the beginning of the game. Mix in the concept of managing both a standard attack, multiple Unite Morphs that all have different ranges of effects depending on the enemies, and dual screen touch controls and the battle system gets rather overwhelming very quickly. I've heard many stories of players not giving the game a fair shake because the intro to the gameplay was just not clicking for them or convoluted. The sad thing about this is that if the player were to work past these initial obstacles, I'd be willing to bet that the battle system would click and it would get tremendously more enjoyable and much deeper than the original impression. Now, of course, not everyone will love this battle system and that's fine. I do think, though, that if more people were to get past the initial blah of the battle system, that more people would end up singing the game's praises. I mean, even when I first played the demo for the game, I have to admit that I was not very impressed. But I ultimately picked the game up purely due to its charm. And boy am I glad I still jumped in, because the battle system and, well, everything else gets so freaking good. Once I purchased those skills, especially the Unite Guts, and hit a certain point in the game, everything just, you guessed it, clicked. I was swapping between Unite Morphs, a Flying Fist here, Smack of the Whip there, Shot of the Gun, followed by a couple standard attacks and dodges, and navigating the battle system with ease. 
just like other Platinum titles, the Wonderful 101 has a ranking system. You can get a better rating depending on damage you've taken, combos and variety used within battles, and how fast you get through each section. Now, in other Platinum games, I always felt bad? Maybe, maybe ashamed? Of my performances, especially when I first started a game. Going through a section thinking, man, I did pretty well, only to be greeted with a lower rank, just, it just got to me. Though those ranks are still in the Wonderful 101, and they still sting a little when I don't get a decent rank, the battle mechanics and sheer goofiness that flow through every aspect of the game strangely encourage you. What I mean is this, the game spurs the player to get better in a way that instills hope that it can be done along with the sense that pride is waiting at the end of it all. Much like when you're riding a bike up a steep hill, you look up and realize you're only halfway up, but it's all downhill once you reach the top. So it spurs you on to get over that last push. Once the hill has been traversed, there's a feeling of accomplishment and pride. There's a moment of, hey, I did it, even though I was ready to give up. To bring it back to the wonderful 101, sure, you may get some low scores on a first run through of a section, but you can get a better rank. Just give it another try. This mentality of glass half full is spurred on by, well you probably guessed by now, the nature of the game itself. It's lighthearted, it's quirky, and it doesn't take itself too seriously. So you shouldn't take a low ranking too seriously either. Just play, get better, and have fun. Don't focus on being perfect the first time through, but rather focus on really learning and mastering the tools the game offers. This is what defines the battle system. There are definitely some low points, like how they ended up doing the map slash Wonderful Ones placement map system, but these were expected. Well, I at least expected them to be a bit awkward. This game was made with a dual screen and touchscreen combo, so the usage of analog sticks or the little touch area on the PS4 controller are wonky attempts to make the transition, but I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm a firm believer that audio can truly make or break a game. Sure, the core gameplay mechanics are most important to the foundation of a good game, but the audio, both various in-game cues and the soundtrack, can really change how one feels about a game. So how does a wonderful 101 hold up in this department? It is ridiculous, over the top, the cheesiest of cheese, and, well, actually quite excellent. From the very start, the Wonderful 101 tells you what it is aiming to be through two things, its visuals and its music. First, the player is greeted with a visual style that instantly emits a toy-like feel to it, while the music somewhat takes a little bit of a back seat. However, it doesn't take long for the audio to step into the spotlight and really shine. As soon as we hear our first protagonist, Wonder Red, speak to his endangered students on a runaway bus, we know exactly what this game is going to be. A pure cheese fest in the way that endearingly goofy shows like Power Rangers excel at. A fearful, stammering teacher wrought with panic to protect his students is both touching and, well, over the top. The kids seemingly yelling every line of dialogue match Wonder Red's level of cheese in a stark contrast bombastic fear alongside subdued fear, but it's when Wonder Red turns into a wonderful one with the help of his trusty Wonder Pendant that we really see who this character is. I think a good summary of the voiceover work and audio cues can be summed up in Wonder Red's true reveal, specifically when the transformation has finished. Upon completing the transformation to the lovable hero dressed in a shiny tight suit, the camera does a quick zoom in on Wonder Red while he punches forward and yells an enthusiastic "Hiya!" Oh, but that's not the end of it. In a way reminiscent of, again, Power Rangers, the zoom in and "Hiya!" repeat not once, but two more times. What we are told here through the audio and visual combination is that this game is leaning heavily into childlike perception of power and pure awesomeness and goofiness.
But as if that wasn't enough, the unseen narrator juxtaposes this pure ridiculous nature of everything else we have seen. An overly dramatic and serious voice focused on dropping a large amount of exposition and world building narrative to help the player understand this world they've been suddenly dropped into. But while the narrator goes on about the suits granting their users with tremendous power and the ability to literally unite people, goofy antics play out on the screen, indicating this is boring and we need to get back to the more ridiculous stuff. Then a theme song hits. Well, it's sort of a theme song. Powerful, enthusiastic, over the top, sorry, I hope you're used to me saying over the top by now, vocals greet the player's ears and somehow roar over the even more boisterous instrumental composition that suddenly begins playing. Every time I play this game, I can't help but smile when this song kicks in and Wonder Red streaks across the roof of the runaway bus desperately attempting to reach the front and gain control of the hilariously long vehicle. All of this, what I just explained, happens within the first 10 minutes or so of the game. The first 10 minutes. The developers set the tone with both visuals and audio, especially the audio from the outset, and only keep cranking up the wackiness and silliness all the way until the climax, which I will not even attempt to go into because it is something that just really needs to be experienced. Now, I want to get something out of the way here. I'm not incredibly impressed by the remaster for the Switch version, and what I've seen of the other versions is better, but not quite what I expected. The frame rate isn't a completely smooth experience, so not as big an upgrade from the Wii U version as I'd hoped, and the resolution isn't upper tier stuff. However, these aren't to say that it is a bad port necessarily. This is more of a good enough port. Honestly, I'm just happy that this game exists on the newer hardware, so the few technical quirks aren't much of a deal breaker in my opinion. With that being said, the biggest hurdle for porting this game to any other hardware is how the dual screen gameplay was to be implemented. This is a mixed bag, but ultimately, what was done here is decent, and it is made better specifically in regard to the Switch version by being able to play this fully in handheld mode. In regard to the Wonderful Ones map slash menu, from the original Wii U version, which is the map that displayed on the gamepad and was used to draw out the different Unite morphs and view different Wonderful Ones and all that, it's not the greatest, but it suffices. Since this has been combined into one screen, whether playing on a TV or in handheld mode on the Switch, the map honestly becomes a bit of a hindrance. In fact, I was a bit surprised that it was kept at all, but the way that Platinum dealt with this is the ability to move the map off screen. It can be brought back into view with the touch of a button and can also be placed on the screen by touching it and moving it when in Switch handheld mode. And speaking of clutter and screen space, the sections where the players navigate into buildings are just, they're not very good. In the original, these were handled by keeping a level on the TV but opening up the new icon on the gamepad screen. They were still clunky in the original, but it was a little easier to do things with the way the gamepad was used. In the remastered version, it still feels clunky, like wonky camera angles and controls, and trying to have all of these characters fill into a small space while the camera is zoomed way in. But now, there isn't the neat factor of a second screen, so everything feels a bit jumbled and it slows down the otherwise excellent pacing throughout the game. The most important aspect of the port from the Wii U, however, is, as you may have guessed, the implementation of using Unite Morph. On the Wii U, this could be done with the right joystick, but the way the developers wanted players to default to was to draw the morphs on the gamepad touchscreen. When I played through the Wonderful 101 for the first time on the Wii U, I had a tough time initially. 
In fact, I started out drawing the morphs, then switched to the joystick. But I ultimately migrated back to using the touchscreen and began excelling in the combat. I had gotten so used to moving around with the left stick and drawing out my morphs with my right hand that it was second nature, and it was a pretty great idea in my opinion. But how do you translate such a unique and incredibly specific game mechanic that is so integral to the hardware that it debuted on? Essentially, this is locked to using the right joystick. On PC, it's a bit different when using a mouse and keyboard. The PS4 scheme offers either the right joystick to draw morphs or the centered touchpad on the DS4 controller. For Switch, the option when playing on a TV is simply the right joystick, but since the Switch screen is touch sensitive and there is a handheld mode, this is perhaps the closest way to mimic the original experience, though it isn't quite the same. The common thread between the versions is that it just doesn't completely replicate the original way to play. Much like everything else I've outlined in the port, drawing morphs is simply good enough. Thankfully, the adapted gameplay controls don't affect the gameplay mechanics on a whole too much, and the core experience is still intact. After a couple hours getting familiar with using the right joystick to create morphs, I was back to smashing the faces of evildoers with Unite Fist. Something I want to point out here to put a cap on the port itself and the gameplay mechanics revolving around the morphs. They were difficult to master and sometimes just simply create it all in the original version. And they are the same in the remastered version. Yes, it's a bit unorthodox and some would say it's wonky, but I don't agree with that. It became an initial goal for me in the game. Master the control scheme. Once I was able to really understand the controls, it was like a brand new game had opened up to me. My next goal became going back and getting better ranks on all the previous missions I had failed so hard on and just gotten through originally. What was once a feeling of failure when greeted with a consolation prize had turned into a massive sense of accomplishment with pure platinum. The game expects the player to learn the control mechanics, then challenges the player further to excel in using them to the point of mastery. In all honesty, it will most likely be a very rough start for the majority of players. However, if the player sticks with it and adapts, it is incredibly rewarding. Just a few tips before I move on to my final point. Purchase the Unite Guts and Unite Spring as soon as you can, and don't expect to be perfect the first time through. In fact, expect to go through failure before the gameplay clicks for you. The absolute biggest pro in the Wonderful 101 is its core, its identity, if you will. This game knows exactly what it wants to be, then shapes everything else around it to be accurate reflections of this identity. The audio? Ridiculous. The visuals? Comics and Power Rangers fell in love, had a baby, then dressed it in a Technicolor jacket of enthusiasm. The battle mechanics? Just as quirky as every other aspect of the game. I, I think you get what I'm saying here. The Wonderful 101 knows that it wants to be quirky from the start, then one-ups itself in a very purposeful fashion, mind you, all the way to a finale that had me both in awe and chuckling with pure delight. Everyone who worked on this game had a clear goal in presentation, and they made sure it stuck the entire way through. I can earnestly say that I have never played a game like The Wonderful 101, and I'm not sure I ever will again. This quirkiness is equally matched with charm, and it was this level and type of charm that encouraged me to stick with the gameplay controls, to stick with the game even through constant initial failure, to stick with it and play through the game again and implement my newly discovered skills. It's easy to see that this game was created by talented people who had a passion for the project and wanted a pure, childlike awe of the good guys saving the day to really shine through, and shine through it does. Crazy battles, large-scale set pieces, ridiculous voice acting, overly exaggerated motions and acts of heroism, music that is a finely aged cheese, and visuals and art direction that share a resemblance to shiny toy figurines. This game wants you to take in everything it has to offer and hopes that you enjoy it as much as it enjoys itself. To put it as simply as possible, the Wonderful 101 is a game unlike any other I've played. 
It takes the action genre and twists it into a new creation, one where its flaws are far surpassed by its pros, and even some aspects that appear to be flaws upon first inspection are actually hurdles to overcome on the path to what the core game really is. I can't recommend this game enough, and though I know it won't appeal to a wide audience, I hope that it finds its home in the hearts of more players and creates fans out of them. If you take what the game has to offer, honestly try to overcome the initial steep learning curve, and just absorb the joyous childlike outlook on the world, I believe that you'll find a new beloved game as I have. Their